Honey is valuable. Whenever something's valuable, people find ways to cheat. It is a, a science and an art to conning people into putting rice syrup, corn syrup, whatever you can to just cut the honey down and make more of a product. You really should buy your honey from an institute that is sourced directly from beekeepers. Good honey ain't cheap and cheap honey ain't good. So the Albies Lab is uh, this building that we're currently located in on Auburn's campus. The research we do here is focused on honeybees and mostly towards um, the control of pests and disease that are causing issues for honeybee production. I'm Clint Walsh and I'm a research assistant here at the Auburn's Lab. So Varroa mite research is really uh, our bread and butter. It's, it's the backbone of the research that we do here at the lab. Um, Varroa mite is a parasitic mite that will latch itself onto all the, the bees in a hive. And just like a tick, they will suck the, the blood and a lot of the nutrition out of the honeybee, making them in a weakened state. They also vector a lot of diseases. It is the, the Achilles heel of successful beekeeping is to get on top and control a varroa mite. And it is a challenge because you're trying to kill effectively a insect with use of insecticides. And even though the mite is uh, technically a spider, you're using a lot of the same chemical controls that you would, um, could harm the bees. So here at Auburn, we do have a number of colonies, um, sometimes upwards of 400 colonies. And so one of the products, and although we're focused on research, one of the products of having this many colonies is the honey. So one of the things that's kind of unique about what we do here at the Bee Lab is we do what I call small batch honey. So we keep track of every yard and right through the process. So the bottling included will have um, a QR code on the back and that QR code will take you to the information as far as uh, where the honey was sourced, the location, who was working on it. And um, all that information is on the internet and you can follow it with a QR code. So really unique, I think, compared to most commercial outfits where all the honey just ends up in vats and gets blended together, we are um, keeping track of it by location and by seasonality. And you really do get variations. You know, you just take these two, for example, and there's obviously, there was a different nectar flow on. This is probably more like a Chinese tallow, and this could have been more of a early season clover or a blackberry honey. So there is some value in compartmentalizing the honey. Uh, we think it gives a little bit of a, a taste profile that we're able to follow through. This, so this is this year's uh, batch of honey. Uh, as you can see, that's the front label. And then this is the, uh, the QR code that he was talking about. It's either me or Trey. <laughs> the Clinton Trey Show. My name's uh, Trey Ingram. Uh, I am a research assistant here at Auburn University. We had the building to ourselves yesterday afternoon and we were we were cranking up pretty well, loud. Well, we thought we had the building to yeah, ourselves yeah. actually. And then our professor came out of there and was like, oh, you're still here. <laughs> we mix it up. If he's DJing, it's classic rock. If I'm DJing, you could get anything from 90s hip hop to classic rock. It starts out there in the bee yard. Um, at a time of year that is suitable for the harvest of honey. So right now we are, uh, are harvesting our honey. Um, we have just wrapped up our major nectar flow and the boxes are hopefully full of resource honey that has been fully capped and at that time I will decide to harvest a yard. So once the decision has been made to harvest, um, I arrive on the, on the, at the yard with all my equipment and uh, normal beekeeping procedures, we'll light a smoker, uh, we'll prepare what we call the fume boards and that's a, a tool that we use to get the bees off of the um, of the the honey supers and then we will go into the colonies removing the lid we'll inspect the honey super to see if it's suitable to be harvested 
If it is, we'll apply a fume board on. A fume board is actually just a, a very simple uh, bit of cloth, absorbent fabric that we apply butyric acid to. It has a very nasty smell to it. Uh, you could describe it any number of ways. I, I describe it as like Parmesan cheese on a hot day. For whatever reason, the bees really don't like this and it runs them out of the boxes. But effectively, by the time we leave, we'll have stripped all the um, honey supers off of the colonies. We'll have loaded it onto the trucks and we'll be heading back here to the yard, to the bee lab, our home yard. Once we arrive here, we'll set up, we have set up a drying trailer. Uh, we can load the boxes in there in sort of a crisscross pattern. And with the dehumidifier running, and the fans blowing that dry air around will actually wick water out of the, the honey supers. And we might take the moisture content from 20% down to 18% over the course of about three days. After three days of drying, we'll then bring the honey supers here into the lab where we'll start the extraction process. So one of the first steps once we get the honey into the lab is the uncapping. So some of the toys we have to play with our, um, we got this hot knife, which is actually quite satisfying to remove the wax cappings with, and a good frame that's been fully capped, and the honey is actually quite proud. This thing does a really great job. It works nice and fast, and you're able to create these little egg rolls that are um, go into the wax tray, where we'll eventually we'll render that wax into blocks, and we can make candles. Sometimes we need it for experiments. After the frames have been uncapped, we'll place them in a centrifuge where we have a 20 frame extractor that will then spin the frames and that will actually remove the honey from the frames. So as you can see, we're just loading the frames in uh, vertically. Um, again, this, this uh, extractor will hold 20 frames of uh, medium frames. A medium box is this size uh, box here, we also referred to as supers. Uh, they sit on top of the, the, the beehives, uh, and this is where uh, the bees will uh, typically uh, keep their honey. So what this, this is actually like a clutch system for the belt, um, and so we turn this dial. Uh, we start out kind of slow because there could be some weight imbalance inside the centrifuge, kind of like a, a washing machine if your load's unbalanced. Uh, and so it's kind of a little bit of an art to making sure it's uh, spinning with just enough speed to sling the honey, but not enough to start sending this thing rotating around on the floor. So now, you, as you can see, it's already starting to flow out. Once the honey's been extracted, it goes into a gravity clarifier. That gravity clarifier will separate a lot of the large wax particles, and, and uh, it also heats up the honey to just about 100 degrees, so everything just kind of moves a little more freely. After that, it'll be pumped into a filter where a filter bag is and that will get out all the insect parts and little bits of wax and just all the offensive material. Uh, once it goes through the filters, uh, it will drip down into, uh, you can see the five gallon bucket down there. Uh, we'll, it'll fill that bucket up. Uh, our challenge is to make sure that it doesn't overflow. Uh, <laughs> a couple mistakes there, don't ask me how we know that. Anyway, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll fill that bucket up uh, and uh, once that's done, we'll load another bucket under, uh, open the valve and let it flow. We'll take that bucket and label it, uh, what yard it came from. That is 60 pounds of pure goodness. Once we've stored the honey, uh, the next thing is bottling. And so at an appropriate time when we decide to have our honey sale, uh, we will take the buckets and we will put it into a bottling tank. We'll allow that tank to settle for 24 hours just to allow for anything not honey to float to the top. And then uh, we'll start the bottling process. I got this set at about 110. As you can tell, it's just flowing really nicely. We don't want to overcook the honey. We don't want it to uh, denature or, um, or burn, which will cause the honey to darken. But uh, we do want it to move. <laughs> and so having it uh, slightly warm and able to pour, it's, it's nice. I do eat a fair amount of honey. My wife is like a stage three poo bear. The bottling then leads to the labeling and we're very careful to have that traceability through the whole process. And so we sell the honey to students and faculty 
and anyone else who wants it. And when they get that product, they can see on the back of it a QR code and it'll give a unique identifier that tells a little bit about where that came from and potentially who worked on it and what condition the honey was in when it was harvested.